ladies and gentlemen a very good afternoon to each and every one of you welcome to the 16th dr joseph thomas memorial lecture on behalf of department of Bio biology at iit madras and the dr joseph thomas memorial science club i extend a warm welcome to all of you gathered today we are truly honored to have such esteemed speakers and guests in our midst and i'm confident that the insights and perspective shared today will be both enlightening and inspiring. Without further ado, let us now start a program by welcoming the head of the department, Dr. Sandeep Senapati, to the stage to deliver his opening remarks. Welcome everyone uh, to the 16th uh, Joseph Thomas uh, Memorial Lecture. Um, so we are hosting it uh, the 16th consecutive years. Um, and uh, very happy to see all of you coming back uh, again here. Um, so let me start by welcoming uh, uh, Joseph Thomas uh, Memorial Club members, uh, Dr. Lokeshari, Dr. Uh, Ramal, uh, uh, who were associated with uh, Dr. Thomas uh, from Speak Days. Uh, uh, thank you and welcome uh, here. Uh, and other uh, club members who are also perhaps joining online, some of them. Uh, and then uh, warm welcome uh, to the school and college students and the teachers uh, who have come here uh, all the way from your Haraya school and colleges. Um, we are going to have a very enlightening uh, enlightening uh, lecture by uh, Professor Soma Mukherjee. Uh, he is from IT Bombay and also currently the director of BIRS Pilani Hyderabad. Um, about Joseph Thomas, uh, I think my colleague Manoj, uh, uh, he knows better and he will tell a lot about him. Uh, back in 2006 when I joined, uh, I met uh, Joe. Uh, uh, we affectionately used to call him Joe. Uh, and one or two years, uh, we int interacted quite a few times. Uh, and uh, if you remember, the photo uh, was taken by us. So uh, all the two years, um, whenever we met, we used to see him all smile. Uh, and you know, in spite of uh, those days where uh, we are struggling to bring bring our um, building to get uh, to recruit the new faculty uh, to uh, attract students. Um, the colleagues who joined, we are uh, maybe just six, seven that day, uh, we used to struggle. But Joe taken all the pain by himself, but keeping all smile all the time. Uh, so whenever I think of him, I remember him, I get only that smiling face, uh, uh, hiding all the tension uh, in the back. Um, I think, yeah, we have, uh, you know, a series of, uh, uh, you know, uh, events coming up. Uh, so I'll keep it short. Uh, I welcome one, uh, once again to all of you, and uh, let's look forward, um, uh, you know, a very fruitful afternoon and very interactive. Thanks once again for coming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjeev Senapati, for the welcome address. Next, I'd like to call upon Dr. Rama Vaidyanathan, member of uh, Dr. Joseph Thomas Memorial Science Club to the stage to share a few words remembering Dr. Joseph Thomas. Thank you, Deepika. So uh, thank you for calling me. Uh, so it's really an honor and a privilege to talk about Dr. Uh, Joseph Thomas. So to introduce Dr. Joseph Thomas. Now, we are organizing the 16th uh, memorial lecture. So uh, those of us who've been associated with him, we do this every year so that we can remind ourselves of the vision that Dr. Uh, JT had for biotechnology. So uh, Dr. JT was instrumental and helped in uh, building up the Department of Biotechnology at IIT Madras. Uh, before that, he was... Uh, the vice president at uh, SPIC, and I'll tell you briefly about his uh, uh, role in at SPIC. 
So Dr. J T, uh, Dr. Joseph Thomas did his uh, PhD in uh, the Institute of Science in uh, Bombay, and he was working on rhizobial and uh, uh, cyanobacterial nitrogen fixation. There were he had uh, very classical papers in uh, uh, nitrogen, biological nitrogen fixation in plant cells and microorganisms. Uh, he was the head, but you know. Uh, about in 1987, he was in his 50s at that time, he decided to move from pure academics to start uh, having a focus on commercialization of biotechnology. So he shifted to Chennai, and this project was sponsored by SPIC. So there were two units that Dr. Joseph Thomas started. One was a SPIC biotechnology division, which was to work on commercializable biotech product, product, projects so in fact, you know, he, they had established three commercialization units. One was a huge uh, tissue culture facility at Coimbatore, and uh, they had uh, uh, protocols for uh, 52 different uh, plant varieties, and they had a, a joint venture with the uh, Netherlands for uh, Gerbera cutflowers. So that was one commercialization unit. The second one was a production facility for uh, fermentation pro products. So they wanted to uh, introduce enzymes which could be used in the detergent industry. And uh, the third was the seeds division. So all of these were commercialized biotech uh, units which were right, running. And to support that, Dr. Joseph Thomas started something called the SPIC Science Foundation, which would focus on industrially uh, relevant uh, R&D and also some academics to it. So there were three divisions in SPIC Science Foundation, the energy division, the uh, agrochemic, uh, agrochemistry and biotechnology. Biotechnology had loosely three divisions, tissue culture, plant molecular biology, and microbial technology. It was a small unit of about uh, 40 to 50 people. So, so I was the first PhD student at the Center for Biotechnology and in SPIC Science Foundations, and, and I'm, I'm really happy and honored to share the insights that I had from my association with him. The uh, first time that I met Dr. Joseph Thomas, uh, so I was the first PhD student. The lab had started in 87, and this was in the Stone Age times. You know, at that time, uh, there was no biotechnology department in IIT Madras. They were operating from a few laboratories in the Department of Chemical Engineering. And biotechnology was offered only as a specialization in the master's level. Only Anna University offered a B.Tech course in biotechnology. So when I joined, uh, you know, when I went to meet him, he immediately took me on for a personal tour of the lab, showing me not just the equipments which were there, but also his plan for the future and how I would play a role in developing the center. And you know, he was showing it with so much of fashion. One would have thought it was the uh, laboratory in the Beckman building in the Scripps research, which was a benchmark in our days. He had so much fashion. He painted such a beautiful picture. That still stays with me, and those who have been to SSF will know that SSF was actually two apartment buildings which was remodeled into a laboratory. But uh, Dr. JT could paint that picture. The, the environment at SSF, you know, it was a very small center with only about 40 people, about 10 uh, PhD holders. We, we call them scientists. Then there were some PhD students, and there were the project fellows and lab attenders, small unit. And uh, uh, everybody was on a uh, first name basis, you know, which is not a big deal now, but at that time it was a rarity, especially because we were in a very highly conservative and hierarchical system just outside. The, the SPIC company was very, very hierarchical, but here we were talking to each other on first, uh, first name basis. And uh, Dr. Joseph Thomas was very, very polite. You know, when one of the conferences that we all had attended uh, JT was uh, waiting to talk to, uh, I was waiting to uh, talk to JT because Dr. JT was talking to somebody else. As he was waiting, he called me and uh, introduced me to the other person as my colleague at SSF. And I was a lowly graduate student. He was a vice president at SPIC, but he called me a uh, colleague and you know that made sure that my self-esteem went high and my identity with SSF was very high. Probably a reason why uh, People who joined SSF didn't leave it uh, so soon. Yeah, so the other thing, uh, so the, there were group meetings in uh, SSF, and it was mandatory for everybody to attend that, whether they were PhD students or scientists. 
And most of these were uh, on projects that uh, the scientists were working on. So they would, uh, Dr. Joseph Thomas was very, very adventurous. Whenever he went on a tour, he would come back brimming with an idea. No, I think this idea is going to work. That's a fantastic commercial opportunity. He would convince somebody to do a market survey, another person to do a feasibility study and get uh, protocols ready, and then they would start the implementation and the experimentation. And after about six months to one year, uh, there would be a moment of truth. They would decide whether they want to go past, go for the commercialization step or not. And I know that that could be a very, very difficult step. It was, uh, it was a heartache for the scientists who were working on that because they would have to put everything into cold storage. But uh, so Dr. JT would say, no, you're not married to the product. If it doesn't work, you, you should move on. So that was the logic that they had. And uh, for every product that was commercialized, there were at least you know, 20 projects that were uh, for which they had made an analysis and at least five projects which didn't make it after the six months to one year. And all of this was done, you know, Dr. JT did not have an MBA in entrepreneurship. None of the scientists in his department had a entrepreneurship, but he made them all work and do all this extra work. So I think that was something that only uh, somebody like JT with so much of energy could have done. Yeah, so uh, yeah, there's no light here, so I really can't. So you guys are lucky. My speech is going to be very short because I can't read what I've written. Yeah, so so I uh, I did my PhD there, and Dr. JT would make sure that he attended all the doctoral committee meetings. So when he attended, uh, his questions would not be very procedural details. You know, did you add five microliters or ten microliters or things like that? But it was more like, why are you doing what you are doing? What is the relevance to the society and uh, such questions, you know, for which uh, I don't think anybody can give an answer, uh, whether you're doing a PhD or otherwise, what is the relevance? So he used to ask like that. And uh, one of the meetings, I was working with rice, and I had a batch of rice seeds from a rare variety, and the efficiency of germination was very low. So I wanted to request Dr. JT to use his fantastic influence and network and get me those uh, seeds. So I requested him, and but what I got instead was he showed me a strip of land at Poru near the Ramachandra where the thick hybrid seeds was fun were functioning. And he said, why don't you grow and multiply the seeds yourself there? So you know, from after staring at a single rice seedling, not more than three weeks old, in a test tube in a hydroponic solution, I had to uh, work in the field along with the other people to multiply the seeds for uh, three to four months. So a change in perspective indeed. And also made sure that I never asked Dr. Joseph Thomas for any <laughs> such help <laughs> again. Yeah, so the uh, so we used to have uh, annual uh, uh, family meetings, and uh, Mrs. Nina Thomas, his wife, was very very warm. So uh, so those were uh, regular meetings, and in fact, we even uh, went to their house <laughs> to have an annual meeting. But she was extremely warm and made us all uh, feel that we are uh, part of the family. So uh, Dr. Joe Thomas would have been very happy that Dr. Soumyo is here. Dr. Soumyo is a very accomplished researcher. The, Dr. Kritika will introduce you to him. Uh, so, uh, but you know, today he represents uh, Bith Pilani. And uh, Bith Pilani is uh, synonymous with a very creative and uh, energetic students. We used to have uh, regular interns from Bith Pilani come into the Sikh Science Foundation. They were very excited with the discovery research. But what was a stumbling block was uh, uh, the reports and presentations which could come. You know, uh, just uh, two to three months of discovery research, you don't have anything to write about. But uh, they did uh, give a lot of energy in the department. And he would have been very happy to see PhD students, young faculty, and uh, students from uh, other Dr. MGR and other college students who are hopefully watching this online because Dr. JT was very, very passionate about research and uh, scientific research, how it should be done. And uh, you know, we uh, continue to have this JT Memorial Lectures because uh, we want young students to be inspired to do research and have the same tenacity that uh, Dr. JT had towards research, be adventurous. And I hope you enjoyed the talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.
Dr. Rama for sharing the beautiful memories and enduring legacy of uh, Dr. Joseph Thomas. Next, I'd like to call upon Dr. Manoj from Department of Bio Biotechnology, IIT Madras, to share his personal experiences and insights regarding Dr. Joseph Thomas from an IIT perspective. Um, good evening and welcome to all the guests. Uh, I think I have missed only one of these 15 lectures. You heard from uh, Dr. Rama, the personality, <coughs> Dr. Joseph Thomas. But I, I want to put that in the context of IIT Madras itself and this department. 2002, there was a plan in IIT Madras to start the biotech department. And of course, a fiercely, you know, engineering, traditional conservative engineering institution. Uh, having a bio department was a was a major decision, uh, was a big risk. I think uh, the then director, Professor Anand, took. And then, of course, he had the right advice. And he wanted somebody uh, equally pushy uh, to advise the department and take this forward. But that's not because that's not going to happen so easily in a department like this. That's the context, I think, in which uh, Dr. Joe Thomas was brought in in 2003. Uh, the department uh, started off in a small way associated with the Department of Chemical Engineering uh, with a couple of faculty from there uh, uh, moving here and so on. Uh, it, it was in 2004 that uh, the department was formally founded. By then about 10 of us, including me, had joined the department. We were all, you know, most of us were young. There were a couple of uh, senior people also. Uh, I remember the day I joined, you know, the HOD was Professor Guhan. He took me to meet uh, JT and like Sanjeev described. He said the, the warmth in his uh, smile, you know, is worth uh, uh, a good memory, right? Uh, that I think most of my colleagues who know him will uh, uh, will agree with, okay? So uh, uh, just a couple of things I, I, I thought I should share about what happened during those days. 2003, the department is new, uh, uh, even getting a uh, building or even having an air conditioned lab was a luxury in this campus. My senior colleagues from other departments will uh, agree. We were 10 of us, all young people. Uh, we were spread out on five, six buildings across campus because there was this building wasn't there. Uh, we had offices in different places. We hardly met, okay, except for uh, department faculty meetings where we used to have arguments. Well, you know, why don't we buy this equipment? This is more important. I want my spectrophotometer, he wants his x-ray machine and so on. And somewhere between all this, you know, Dr. Thomas uh, was the senior man keeping us in place. We were young, roaring to go. Okay, so there was this very stable character there, very experienced character. Uh, a wonderful man, uh, uh, very dignified, very positive. Okay, he would tell something very harsh, uh, which would sound, you know, very pleasant. Okay, that was his uh, uh, very nice trait. You know, uh, that doesn't come, you know, by age. You know, it, 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 I think it is, it is innate in him. Okay, so together with the department heads, then Dr. Suresh Kumar, I think he is online, uh, and Guhan, we had so many meetings, and uh, at, at his senior position, he could actually push uh, the institute at uh, that level, that level of the administration, to give us money, infrastructure. Uh, to buy equipment and so on, uh, uh, where he pushed this, uh, you know, experience. It's very difficult to say no to him. I think Professor Anand made a fantastic decision to call him as an advisor. He was an advisor from 2003 to 2006, and uh, uh, then he sort of retired, and we brought him back as a uh, research member of the research, chairman of the research advisory committee, stayed on for two more years. Uh, uh, and most of us didn't know he had some health issues. Uh, because he, we never could guess from uh, uh, him, right, on the outside. Uh, at least, you know, at least a couple of things I, I wanted to say, you know, this building came up in 2007. Uh, the blueprint was drawn in 2003. And from then on, you know, you would see JT's imprint on the blueprint, okay. Uh, he opens up these huge sheets uh, in his office, make me sit on the side, and, you know, he says this, this lab should be like this, this is the furniture should be this way, and this is the faculty who will probably move into that lab, okay? And this this part of it, we should have this 
that was the level of commitment uh, he had like uh, you know dr rama said okay future proofing this building we were only 10 faculty this building was set up for 30 but he had a vision for all 30 of us you know at different places in this building that, that that's amazing and i am i am a first hand uh, witness to that uh, uh, all those activities and we used to make frequent visits to the engineering unit uh, uh, office discuss with these uh, site engineers you know draw redraw you know make them do these things again and again uh, every week meeting uh, every week there used to be a meeting an hour and he used to come fully prepared he had a notebook with you know three pages of notes okay uh, uh, and he used to have those discussions there uh, that was the level of commitment he had uh, uh, given a job uh, the other thing he, you know, he he always used to tell us, you know, we were we were all largely basic sciences when we all joined, meaning basic sciences, trained in basic sciences. Uh, uh, but then he he used to say, I think Chennai has lot of medical institutions. It's time that you know IIT Madras uh, combine, you know, engineering and medicine and create a new set of medical biotechnology. So th 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 that that was a, a, a again a uh, uh, far reaching you know idea uh, it didn't happen then but he definitely put us in touch with some good hospitals here uh, some of you probably know madras medical mission it's an outstanding hospital there's a frontier lifeline they were colleagues of his or people who knew he put us all in touch and now there is a very vibrant you know collaborative program between us and those hospitals that's a fantastic achievement it did take time not when he was around, but now, you know, in retrospect, yeah, it, it, it has worked out so well. Okay. Uh, we, we used to call him for department uh, faculty meetings, uh, advisory position, uh, but then he knows where he, where he can put his point and, uh, you know, stay there. Okay. Uh, he always keeps that in mind. Like uh, Rama again said, right, uh, colleagues, we are all colleagues, the junior most to uh, the senior most people. I think if Dr. Thomas were here, he would have been really happy with the way the department turned out. We started off with 10. We are 37 faculty now. We have two buildings okay, uh, 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 on the ground, full of people, full of labs, full of equipment, lot of different projects, uh, lot of tie-ups with hospitals, uh, lot of papers you know, in basic medical sciences and applied medical sciences. There is a fantastic center for can uh, called Cancer Tissue Bank. If, if you have time, please do visit. Okay, So he, he must be very happy. Oh, okay, on the online, okay. He will, uh, you know, he would have been very happy if he were uh, here, he would have visited and so on. The institute is also a lot more responsive. Uh, there are uh, biology related or biotechnology related colleagues now in other departments. This is a far cry from when I uh, uh, joined this institute. There's a lot of cultural change happening in this institute and I think uh, JT would have been very happy if he were here. So. This is a fantastic occasion to remind, uh, of course, I also get reminded of him during this period. You know, people vanish slowly from memory, but then if you do these exercises every year, you know, keeps, uh, I think that's why we have to do this uh, every year, and I think this will go on. We have had uh, 16, 15 outstanding speakers all these years. We have the 16th one uh, today. Uh, 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 today's speaker is a slight, uh, no, uh, deviation from the previous speakers, not uh, any less illustrious, but uh, previous speakers were all basic sciences, uh, uh, from the basic sciences. They were all mostly people who knew uh, Joseph Thomas, and now we have somebody who's going to talk about uh, uh, an engineer's roaming in the domain of biology. Again, JT would have been very happy to hear this. And thank you, and uh, welcome uh, to this function. So uh, uh, the JT Memorial Science Club uh, uh, started off this series of lectures with an endowment uh, coming off from uh, uh, people who are who formed the club. Uh, club. Uh, uh, they they are now adding to that endow endowment. Uh, we have been using this endowment to run these lecture series. Uh, now they have a, a, a addition to this endowment. Very happy to hear that. Uh, we will be able to do lot more activities. I request the club members, Dr. Rama, Dr. Loki, uh, to come onto the stage and uh, our head, uh, Sanjeev, who is going to 
uh, receive the check. Okay. Thank you. No zeros are, uh, you know, one less zero is not any less, you know, important, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj, for providing us with a valuable glimpse into the life and work of Dr. Joseph Thomas. Next, I'd like to call upon Dr. Kritika Ravi from Department of Biotechnology, IIT Madras, who will be introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Soumya Mukuchi. Good evening to all. It's my privilege to introduce our chief guest today, uh, Dr. Soumya Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee did his B.Tech in Instrumentation Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur, and M.S. in Mechanical Engineering at Colorado State University, U.S., and he did his Ph.D. in Biomedical Engineering at the University of North Carolina, U.S. After his Ph.D., he joined IIT Bombay in 1997, where he is an institute chair professor in the Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering. Uh, he was the head of the Center for Research in Nanotechnology and Sciences, as well as the head of the Analytical Instrument Facility at IIT Bombay from 2010 to 2013. He served as the Dean of Student Affairs at IIT Bombay from 2015 to 2019. Presently, he is the director of BITS Bilani, Hyderabad campus, Telangana, on lien from IIT Bombay. Professor Mukherjee has prestigious fellowships from the Indian National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences, India. His research interests are in biosensors and bioinstrumentation, which includes physical, chemical, and biological sensing systems, both micro and macro, for application in health, water quality, and environmental monitoring. In particular, optical fiber and optical waveguide based systems and electrochemical impedance based spectro spectroscopy are the focal points of his research in his lab. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more that uh, he'll be sharing with us today. Uh, once again, please welcome me in joining Dr. Mukherjee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kritika Ravi, for your gracious introduction of our keynote speaker, Professor Soumya Mukherjee. Now I request Dr. Kritika Ravi to hand over a flower bouquet to our chief guest. Over to our chief guest, or Professor Soumya Mukherjee, to deliver today's keynote lecture titled An Engineer Roaming in the Domain of Biology. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll start off anyway till the clicker gets here. Uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <coughs> hmm. Uh, I'm more used to running around the room and the stage while, uh, while speaking. Uh, so, uh, this might um, stint my, uh, my style a little bit, but let's not worry about that. Let's not, uh, let's not worry so much about that. The clicker is good. Okay, as, uh, again, thank you, Rama, thanks, uh, the JT Memorial Club, thanks the Department of Biotechnology, thanks IIT Madras uh, mm, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, the 
again I mean uh, people ask me that what do you do? I mean what science do you do? And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. I mean I, 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 I myself do not know what science I do. Uh, simply because science uh, to me is, a, is, a, is an actual continuum. We have broken down science into physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology probably in the last 100 years or so. Before that science was a continuum. So what science you do really confuses me probably because I am part of the continuum and, uh, and I am spread all over the place. And uh, all of this confusion that biology by engineering confusion rose because of two, three different reasons. One, my dad, a very dedicated orthopedic surgeon. Uh, every evening will come back, tell us about the interesting things that he had done that day. Open big fat books by, there's a guy called Campbell, who uh, he used to say Campbell is Bible or something. Open big fat books and start reading. Okay. Uh, and there were a bunch of physics and math teachers in school and very good teachers in biology, all of that. So, to be, and to biology or not to biology was a, was a big question to me. Medicine, big fat books, following my dad's and my mom's dad's uh, profession of being a medical practitioner or study engineering where I settle fast in life and start earning quote unquote the big, big bucks. Uh, none of that actually happened. Man proposes, God disposes. Uh, so, I, 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 on the advice of very eminent people like Vice Chancellor of Jadavpur University, Principal of Shipur, I went to study instrumentation in uh, IIT Kharagpur. And studying instrumentation, it made me interested in very two very diverse areas. And when I put those diverse areas in front of me, I will say, what? I got interested in steel plants. And I want, got interested in the human body physiology. Now, uh, now that's a that's a little bit of a stretch of imagination. But these two, to me, are the most complex systems to understand in terms of instrumentation. I mean, but I think of a steel plant. Uh, steel plants are, you know, extreme high temperatures, extreme low temperatures. Okay, there are uh, cryogenic um, uh, the things which happen there. Extremely high pressures, extremely low pressures, very high flow rates, very, and the mixture of all of all of the above. So the instrumentation there is actually a fascinating uh, experience. I'll tell you a secret. Half the time, the instrument is the operator's eye. Okay, we will try to put in the thermocouple into the furnace and try to see the temperature. The operator will look at it. Ah, tira so pachas lag hai. Okay, I, and he he will be more or less right within three four degrees here and there. He looked at the color of the slag and he understood. Uh, we tried to do that with uh, bolometers and with all sorts of things. We were never that accurate. And he can also if he, if I tell him the temperature, then he can. Uh, tell me, uh, tell us that aaj isme nickel thoda jada lag gaya lag raha hai. I know and things like that. I mean, it was actually fantastic. Their experience was fantastic. There's a lot to learn from there. So still plan to study in extremes. On the other side, those guys wanted to make me a manager, and I did not like. I wanted to be technical in life, so I ran away. I ran away to US to. I, I thought that uh, the place where I go to, they were uh, they were doing bone related instrumentation. So I can make my father happy and I'll also be happy doing instrumentation. My father is happy because I'm doing orthopedics. When I reached there, that project had ended. So they did not have money. So they said no money, no instrumentation. So I, uh, I actually carried back a femur from one of the bone sellers in India over there later on and uh, tried to map the femur and do a finite element analysis of the femur and see under external fixation. You see, uh, when, when a bone breaks, there are many ways. Uh, if, if it breaks nicely, then you do 
what is called reduction, fracture reduction. And you put it in a cast and everything is fine. If it, if there's a compound fracture or, or the fracture is very, com very little pieces, complex fractures, they will put pins on the two sides of it and uh, just like as you, as you see over here, uh, they will uh, put a big rod and pins into the bone to stabilize it and the callus is growing here, okay. Now, the thing is, of course, this is all engineering, this is biology, okay, uh, or physiology. The, th the issue is, Should I take this rod very close to the body surface? Let's say that this is the body for surface over here. Should I take it very close to the body surface? Uh, then the stress or, uh, or or the force through the rod is more than the than the force that is transmitted through the bone. Uh, that really relieves the bone of much of the, uh, the you know uh, helps the callus form. But there is something called Wolf's law. Wolf's law says that if you give us bones a controlled degree of strain, the bone grows stronger. So, you would rather, oops, uh, you would rather have it very close to the body surface, have this rod very close to the body surface to start with, so that the callus can form properly and slowly over days move this rod out, out outwards to transmit more and more force through the, through the callus so that the osteoblastic and the osteoclastic activity is promoted and uh, there's more calcium laying down over there and so on and so forth, the bone repairs uh, strong. So how do I know where to put? I have to assume certain numbers for the callus, uh, certain elastic modulus for the callus, and then from there, use the elastic modulus of the steel or the pins and all of that, and take that into, into a finite element system to understand how the bone is healing and at what condition the bone is going to heal better. Uh, well, still it was not instrumented. Uh, it was more of civil and mechanical engineering. I did my master's in mechanical engineering, as you heard. I mean, so uh, this was, uh, so mechanical, mechanical is not bad. It's a, it's a good, good branch of engineering. But um, it is, uh, it was not, I didn't want to continue with it really. Uh, and it had a lot of maths in it. Uh, lots and lots of maths. So, Let's do a little bit more of mode of instrumentation. Went off to North Carolina. A, uh, they gave me a fellowship and told me, do whatever you want. Okay, fantastic. Found a guy who was working on sudden cardiac death. Electrophysiology, heart, sudden cardiac death, very, very interesting. So the idea was to trying to understand the electrochemistry of the heart that happens immediately when a regional ischemia sets up. Re ischemia means the complete lack of blood flow to a part of the body. It can be the brain, it can be the heart, it can be the lungs, it can be the legs for that matter. But here, this part is ischemic. Let's say because of some blockage over here. Infarcts don't form immediately. Ischemia f happens, then slowly the cells start dying. And then an infarct from. When the infarct forms, there are all sorts of chemicals that are released, biochemicals that are released, which we can pick up from the uh, bloodstream, you know, troponin, myoglobin, creatine kinase, and all sorts of other ones, which you can pick up. But even before that, when ischemia is happening, mind you, this there we have a problem here that at the border zone of ischemia, the, because of the lack of ATP, the sodium channels, the fast sodium channels, they shut down. Uh, lack of not, a, not only uh, that, that lack of ATP leads to a high potassium and that high potassium, the extracellular potassium and that high po extracellular potassium leads to a 
shutting down or the slowing down or reduction of the high uh, high, uh, high uh, rather the fast potassium uh, sodium channels but protons have a faster diffusion rate than potassium protons diffuse out of this zone zone quicker than than the potassium that is generated because of this uh, the, of the of the sort of metabolism that is going in here sodium channels are blocked the calcium channels are still active leading to very slow conduction in this water zone and that very slow conduction so you have you have one side where there is fast conduction and just fast or normal conduction on the right next to it you have very slow conduction this very slow conduction so one action potential has let's say passed away one wave has gone this very slow conduction has just reached here and it can actually excite these cells because it has gone beyond what is called the refractory period. So it sets up these re-entry circuits that sets up ventricular fibrillation. Time from ischemia to this happening, scary, five minutes. Ventricular time from that to ventricular fibrillation, couple of minutes. Take a total of six. Ventricular fibrillation means that the heart is not beating like boop, 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 it is going like a bag of worms. No blood is getting pumped. No blood is getting pumped means no blood to the brain. I can revive the heart after an hour of ischemia. I cannot revive the brain after 15 minutes of ischemia. The person dies because the brain dies. 4 plus 2 plus the first brain cells start dying at about about 5 to 6 minutes into oxygen not being supplied. 10 to 12 minutes, the first brain cells have started dying 20 minutes down the road, the person is in deep trouble. It is such a problem that people stop doing research on it. People do research on atrial fibrillation because that is that, that induces morbidity. Uh, it is painful, it is, uh, it, 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 uh, you, you might feel chest pain, you know, and so on. And there is, there is a way to tackle it. Ventricular fibrillation, unless you are in a hospital or, for that matter, in an airport. The best place to have a heart attack is an airport, you know that? Okay. Uh, most likely, you, you, can, you can get out of it because there are all those AEDs all over the place. <laughs> and quite a few, large number of people are trained. So, uh, people have stopped almost working on ventricular fibrillation. They find a person who has episodes of ventricular fibrillation. They will put a uh, automatic defibrillator or, a, or this thing in it, but they mostly work with the atrial fibrillation story. Ventricular fibrillation, there are cardioverters and all that. Costly. And if you... If you happen to get one, you are very lucky. Now, abhi, abhi, abhi chalu, chalu hoga bhari kahani. what is the Dughbhari Kahani? This thing happens to younger people. Earlier, they used to say the critical age was 45 to 55. And why is that? Because this part of the heart, which has gone into ischemia because there was a block, does not have any other blood vessel which supplies to that part. That means there is lack of collateral circulation. Collateral circulation starts developing at around 55 odd age, 50-55. They used to say 45 to 55 is the danger, danger zone, 40 to 55. Then they revised it down 35, 30, few days back 25. Okay, and of course that that is probably aggravated by the COVID-induced myocarditis, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et but let, that's not the point. The, so these can be, you know, uh, young heart without collateral circulation is best modeled by in animal kingdom by what pigs. Older hearts, beyond 55, they have developed collateral circulation. If there is blood, lack of blood supply to a part of the heart, 
the other vessels take over, give some chest pain, person lands in the hospital, gets an angioplasty, this, that or, or something, like, something like that done, maybe a CABG also. Uh, the, the doctors call it cabbage, okay. coronary artery bypass graft, which is uh, otherwise also known as open heart surgery. Uh, although that is a wrong term to use because sometimes for valve replacement also you have to do open heart surgery. But uh, it is CABG, coronary artery bypass graft. Uh, one can do that for older people, younger people you won't get a chance. If you, if you see a person who has a heart attack at 40, 45 and lived to tell the tale, you will see a, you will be seeing a very lucky person. Now there is a, there is a problem. We are doing it with the pigs and you see our circulatory system is not nice like a well planned city with straight drains. They go all over the place like branches, tree branches. Uh, so I cut off a part of a blood vessel. What part of the heart it affects I do not know. So there is a big problem. I mean I, I found a way to do that to uh, classify how, how that, how that, uh, uh, how that uh, border I can demarcate, but it is always problem. So I came back to India, thought that I will do research on that area. I developed a model, in vitro model where I can do perfectly straight ischemic boundaries like this. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we have this, Dabba. This is N2 CO2 here in the air pumped. This is a sort of cardioplegic solution with N2 and 95.5 CO, uh, uh, O2 CO2. As I move this tray up and down, I can make exact parts of it ischemic and these are all mounted on a bunch of electrodes from which I can do nice electrical studies. Uh, DHT gave me half the money. Second part never came, no money means no research. Moved away, there was something happened at, at that point of time uh, and uh, I started thinking, Chalo, let us let us do some actually actual engineering. So as I said, physics, chemistry, mathematics and biology form a continuum, continuum of sciences, no border, still about, no, no, this is not 10 years back, this is 100 years back, okay. For, uh, I, I, I also missed a zero, but. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the previous examples show that. But can we detect ischemia? You see, now a person has ischemia. Before it goes into infarct, that means that that particular tissue is effectively dead, we would like to detect it. Or when there is a small infarct, or it is going towards infarct. You go to the hospital with a chest pain, uh, chest pain, uh, they will first give you anti uh, antacid. And by while the time that they will do ECG, ECG is 30 percent false negative. So even if your ECG is perfectly fine, you might still be having a heart attack. So they will do a troponin or myoglobin and things like that. And there is a triage now. Can we use chemistry to capture these blood borne molecules? Use physics to quantify that? Use mathematics to model what is happening? That is the question now. Now, of course, I mean, there is an old stunt slide I keep on using. Sai has seen it long back. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, this, uh, we have used other organisms for testing and sensing the, uh, the food testers or testers for kings, you know. The canary methane sensors in mines, Rab rats, mice, guinea pigs, dogs and pigs for sn sniffing, tracking. And the poor pigs, they, are, they put a uh, thingy on the snout and make them look for the world's most expensive food, truffles, okay. Earthquakes and all these are being human beings using biological sensing mechanisms to their advantage. But the only problem is that these are big, uh, sometimes not reusable. If the food had poison in it, I do not think the food tester can be reused, okay. Um, so. What we are looking for is a itsy bitsy thingy which we can use multiple times preferably or at least the cost will be less. 
Now, so we start by defining biosensors and things like that. Lo lots of people have seen this IUPSC definition. I still would like to point out that it has to have a biological element in close proximity with the s uh, with the signal transducer, okay, for specifically detecting analytes. Started in 1962, at a, and there was nothing called a bio the word biosensor then. Clark and Leo, and although they say Clark and Leo, actually the concept was Leo's concept. Uh, Clark solved a little critical problem on the solution and put his name in the front, and they started the. Uh, I think uh, Yellow Springs Lab, uh, and that was the first uh, uh, company to come up with the uh, glucose biosensor. <coughs> and of course, for the, for all of this, we need a whole bunch of chemistry, a whole bunch of physics, and electrical engineering, and other other stuff. We need to put the receptor on the surface. We have to choose what receptor needs to be on the surface. We have to know the physics and the electrical which is there and all of these are being used in the domain of biology because at the end of it the analyte or the recognition element that we are using is will be typically a biological molecule. So you have to know biology also. If you, if you, if any of you come to my lab, uh, there are four sections, uh, biology and chemistry. Biology, chemistry, physics, electronics, right? And some and another place where the students hang out. Okay, so unless we do all of that, uh, science and inter uh, science does not develop. Science always develops at the boundaries of what we know. Science does not develop in the deepest recesses of what we know. We started off with micro cantilever based biosensors. Uh, very nice. We made very thin, very, very thin cantilevers. Uh, world's thinnest cantilever probably. Uh, is looking at me like this. Uh, <laughs> no, th this, this cantilever had this very interesting property that when we tried to do a, uh, a scanning like a SEM on it, it would flip over. Okay, that charging itself had enough chance for the, for the cantilever to completely flip 180 degrees. And then, then the moment we defocus it, it will go back. We have a video also, so <laughs> you've seen it. Maybe. <laughs> oh, but uh, cantilever yield is very, uh, very. Uh, I, you know, I'm I'm talking to some of the bosses of cantilevers and such main sensors over here. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, if I if I, uh, I mean, she she developed a, a, a very very interesting concept. Let me just talk about that for a bit when we talk about cantilever. Uh, when there is a biochemical reaction, viscosity changes. If viscosity changes, then it is possible that the, um, uh, uh, that the resonance frequency will change if a cantilever is inside there. Or she used that to did something with cholesterol? Uh, triglycerides. triglycerides. Yeah, triglycerides. Uh, so very interesting concepts. Uh, so those are very interesting engineering concepts used completely in the biological domain using biological reactions. To, to produce something useful. So I decided to run away and this uh, diagram I think Sai drew it. Uh, <laughs> long, long, uh, many, many moons ago and I found it to be nice enough to uh, keep using it. Um, uh, so uh, labeled free biosensors and labeled biosensors. Uh, uh, he has taken up labeled biosensors now because they are more sensitive. Uh, I like label free biosensors because they are easy to use and cheaper maybe. Uh, so, what, uh, but otherwise we um, sort of uh, have a similar sort of interests. So, these uh, do not want to get into too much of the physics over here. Uh, the physics says that okay, even a cent uh, light goes through an optical fiber uh, in high school physics, it, it went chick, 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 chick. but uh, it does not go like that. Uh, there is a uh, there is a wave front which propagates, and there is a uh, two tails of the wave front which are peeking out of the uh, core, and those uh, those tails never vanish. So that is the evanescent field, and we can mo the evanescent field gets modified because if a biological reaction or any interaction happens on the surface, and so any interaction on the surface can be picked up 
using a absorption of light which is normally passing through the uh, optical fiber. A uh, simple fiber, pro uh, simple design, uh, shine light into the fiber, shine light into the fiber, uh, have the reactions happening over here, speed up with a spectrometer or a photo detector, as simple as that. And but uh, we were trying to detect bacteria in water. And the problem was posed to us by uh, this Naval Materials Research Lab who wanted our, uh, their ships to know whether the water they are carrying uh, has bacteria in it, in it or not. Now, on the microscope we are seeing that the bacteria are attaching to the surface but on the optical fiber we are not seeing any signal. So why is that? What was figured that because the uh, this fiber was straight, the evanescent field was in, in a tens of nanometers or even low, lesser than that, it was not really re reaching the bacteria almost or it was not uh, interacting enough with the bacteria in order to sense it. So bend it, taper it, do some physical modifications to the fiber to make it more sensitive. Bent it, tapered, uh, uh, bent it using, I started with a candle flame, uh, then other people use butane flames, now people are using plasma and all sorts of things. We detected E. coli now down to even even one cell per mill. And if you, if I, uh, one cell per mill is a, I mean, if you see the, uh, this thing uh, here, it is not very uh, reproducible. I mean, sometimes it comes, sometimes it does not come. So I'm not really happy with this. But the 10 cells per mill is very, very steady. Uh, if you look at this 10 cells per mill, just to give an idea about how much it is, uh, take an Olympic size swimming pool, take a teaspoon of something and put it in that pool. That is the concent that is roughly the concentration of 10 uh, 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 colony forming units per mill. Okay. That is roughly the concentration. So, Imagine how how sensitive it can be, and but uh, there is one problem. The earlier ones we were doing it with UV. UV is good, mm, uh, but the people who produce that UV LED started twisting our arms. Started buying. Uh, we were buying it at thirty dollars per. It became 120, right? 120, 130 dollars. Suddenly, overnight, almost, or usko chahiye chalo, price bada dete hai. So, and I'm not one to tolerate blackmail like that. So, decided let's do something. Let's try to get it into the visible optical range. And how to get it into the visible optical range? By using something which was known since the Roman days, uh, the Lysergus cup. The Lysergus cup is, is one which piqued the interest of Michael Faraday into probing into why this cup looks green when I see it from outside and if I put a candle inside, why does it look red? He devised a theory and actually made what he called divided metals. That was back in 1857 when our first war of independence was going on. Michael Faraday was sitting in London and making divided metals. And those bottles are still there in London, uh, if anyone wants to see. But uh, that is nanotechnology. Okay. So, Roman time nanotechnology to Michael Faraday to, and of course it did transition through a person called Antonio Neri uh, who uh, uh, invented how to make stained glass remain stained and that was around 1600 sometime. Uh, he was a Dutch glass maker and he, he uh, found that if I throw metal salts into a molten vat of glass, 
uh, either it oxidizes or it reduces whatever that happens it, uh, uh, dep depending on the metal and depending on certain conditions he can get different colors of stained glass. So the church stained glasses are not made by painting glasses with anything. The glasses are actually have a color in it mm. and that is through nanotechnology. Anyway, so we took gold nanoparticles and coated them on the fiber. How did we make gold nanoparticles? Chemistry. What was the phenomena that described that these gold nano, what is the color of gold? Golden, many people will say, but color of gold is not golden, it depends on the size. If it is very, very small, then it might be purple or pink. Color of silver is not necessarily silvery, it can be blue or yellow. So, that depends on the size, that depends on the refractive index, that depends on what immune, uh, what sort of reactions are going on on the surface of the, uh, or the, of the gold nanoparticles. Use that, gotten out of those UV blackmailers. Uh, the sensitivity is a little less, 15 to 50, I live with 15 to 50, okay, it's okay. So, we can actually detect specific bacteria, we can detect total bacterial load, we can detect heavy metals using certain reactions, we can detect proteins in serum, uh, we have shown that we, have det we can detect antibiotics in various sample matrices. And it can, be, all of these can be developed with the minimum training and infrastructure. If you guys from MGR college want, want, to, want to learn how to make it, come to science lab, we'll teach you. Okay. <laughs> But uh, seriously, you can, you can just make it in your own lab. You can make it in your garage or in your kitchen. The sensors can be made, can, are almost as simple as that. Uh, so what does the system look like now? The system, okay, uh, this uh, is a system which has a problem. It has a problem because it has a battery inside it. And if I try to carry it on a flight, those guys say, yeah, to, I say, yeah, to bomb hai, nahi to kuch hai, yeah, to danger cheez hai, out. Uh, take the battery out, throw it away sort of thing. Whereas this, here, the battery is outside, it's a simple power bank, okay. Take the power bank out, put it in your uh, checked in, uh, carry on luggage, put the instrument in your carry on luggage, who cares, it will go through. I told my uh, one of the friends who wanted to take it to US, I told him, your problem, hey, don't take it. They said, no, no, I'll take one of each. Of course, this one got into problem. They took, took the battery out and threw it out. So I don't know whether the instrument is, uh, works even. But how costly is it? Can be sold for around, may, maybe even 50 to 80,000 rupees. How costly is it, is it to measure once, depending on analyte, between 80 to 500 rupees. And when we are saying 80 to 500 rupees, remember when you are trying to measure an antibiotic in water at a parts per billion range, we are talking a minimum cost of three and a half to 4,000 rupees, measurement cost. Uh, let me see, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it, it works, uh, but don't blame me if it does not. We can always blame the student, ha, it works. Okay, so this is how simple is it to use in the hands of the user. This is the optical fiber, the cartridge is being put in. You can think of it as a SIM card and a SIM card holder. Okay, so the SIM card is being put into the holder, snapped in. Believe me, it's easier to balance than the, than the SIM card which always falls out from the hole on the other side. And it uh, slide in. Using a micro pipette, uh, that is not required. You can use a standard insulin syringe. Did a little mistake here. Should not have hit the button now. Ah, now he should. He should uh, close the close the box. Make it light side. Hit the button. Start. Done. Wait 20 minutes to half hour. You'll get your outcomes.
So, we have explored a whole bunch of things around these cycles. Direct antibody coating, dendrimer coatings, gold nanoparticles. Now, can we do something else? I mean, um, I mean, PhD students need something newer and newer to do, right? Otherwise, they won't get their degrees and uh, uh, no one wants to do the same experiment ever again, what their predecessors have done. So, we started coating the fiber with something like polyaniline. Polyaniline is known for the past 50 plus years as a conducting polymer and it has been known that uh, if we change the pH of polyaniline, pH in the, of the environment for polyaniline, the optical properties and the electrical properties change uh, oh, uh, because of the change in the oxidation state. I don't want to get into that level. Take the fiber, bend it, put it in a vat of aniline, put uh, put oxygen, uh, ammonium persulfate, takes about a, about a minute or so, uh, one minute, two minutes to develop a nice polyaniline coating. Remember the coating is, uh, when I say nice poly polyaniline coating, the coating is, is in the tens of nanometers, 40, 50 nanometers thick, nothing more than that. What we found with this was, Chemical reaction, although it is not changing, it has nothing to do with pH. It might be just a receptor analyte interaction. It has nothing to do with pH change. It is still changing the optical property of the polyaniline. Why? Probably because of charge cloud changes and probably because of indirect protonation, deprotonation. We are not sure. I have to catch my friend who does this, what is femtosecond uh, or uh, whatever, some second, uh, attosecond, picosecond spectroscopy to trying to figure, figure this out. But it, uh, we did not get uh, convincing results, convincing explanations from anyone including all sorts of hi-fi instruments, other hi-fi instruments. So we developed this polyaliline based fiber optic immunosensor. Now what, what can we do with it? We stick something on the surface, interaction with it, uh, that analyte comes and interacts, great, changes happen, we measure. Human immunoglobulins, I mean basically proteins. Uh, look at now the sensitivity uh, towards that, I mean we are looking at sensitivities of the, of the order of 5 nanograms per mil. And uh, I mean, we have measured down to 37 picomolars and so on. We can also detect a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, so this was something to do with health and environment. This is more to do with the environment and health at the same time. Because water and the uh, and things, it messes us up. We, uh, one of the things, again, I mean, this is biology. And uh, let me get to uh, biology. Uh, Albumin gets denatured in the presence of lead ions. We were discussing one day in a lab meeting or course meeting, and said, albumin gets denatured by lead ions. Beautiful. Uh, so someone says, what's so beautiful about it? I said, if it gets denatured, we can detect that de uh, the denaturation process. So stuck albumin to the surface of the polyaniline. Polyaniline got denatured in the, uh, sorry, the albumin got denatured in the presence of lead ions could detect lead ions down to one picomolar. Very, very sensitive. But this is a thora dukhvari kahani. I mean, this is how scientists work. Huh? I mean, lead, I mean, chalo arsenic measure karte. So, again, biology. Uh, think of a uh, immunoglobulin subjected to heat or chemical treatment or a harsh dose of UV. The fab, uh, fragments break out, the disulfides are exposed. Now these disulfides, you can use them to pick up a whole bunch of metal ions and we thought that it will pick up arsenic very nicely. But it started detecting copper better than arsenic. So we called it a copper sensor. Started, uh, I mean, uh, we were trying to go there. In the absence of copper, it detects arsenic well. Huh? 
but uh, you have to make sure copper is not there. Uh, so, uh, and you know, you know what the what the, the funny part was, uh, the the original immunoglobulin work, uh, so original polyanilin work, which actually showed a real new discovery. If I have discovered anything in my life, I mean that is the one thing that Shutapa Chandra, uh, who was my PhD student, and I discovered. We sent it to journals. This is they, they they rejected it. We published in Sensors Actuators B or something. After that, when we published uh, sent this Copperwala paper, they accepted it in three weeks. This is a derivative paper. This is not the original discovery. <laughs> so uh, we we now have a say, ah, copper is a micronutrient required for plant growth. We should measure it. So we go around beating our chest and say, ah, we can measure copper. Tap water, Pawai Lake water, marine water, we can measure copper at very, very low concentrations. Very happy. Uh, so environmental samples, I mean, we have to do all of these things to show that you can measure it in various types of sample matrices because matrix, matrix effect comes into role. Uh, whenever I try to tell my wife, that we measured this thing. Have you looked at the matrix effect? Uh, matrix effect, matrix. what matrix? Uh, you, you need to look at it, this water, that water, the matrix, what is behind it? I mean, it will be in, in some matrix. If the matrix has an effect, then you got to, well, you got to get rid of the matrix effect, okay. So we targeted marker now, okay. Again, let's go back to biology. So here, the biology tells us that chitrosan is a good receptor for mercury. So we did this chitosan capped gold nanoparticle coated fiber and detected mercury. Okay. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that the background is continuously engineering principle that light passing through the fiber, chemistry principle, polyanilin doing some change, why we don't know. Uh, the front is biology. Okay, so essentially the engineer roaming around in the biology domain. This is a very, very dangerous slide. Please don't quote it. Uh, when I, when I, when we are going to publish this uh, result, uh, I was scared. Uh, quite a few of these samples are taken from near coal plants. Near coal plants, we found <coughs> the vegetables which are grown should not have it. How will you know whether there is a, uh, the, the vegetable that you are eating has been grown around the coal plant or not? We have no idea of knowing. So, dharna bed jata tha, coal plant band kar jata tha, power band ho jata tha. I mean, no one thinks about those things. But so we published under anonymized uh, these things, but telling you secretly don't uh, in fish near the it is very interesting uh, we took uh, water from uh, our juhu beach that did not show mercury juhu beach then i think she also collect, collected it from that marine drive area uh, girgaon uh, girgaon chopati water did not have much mercury but when we tested the sharks and the tunas, which was which we got from the local market, which had caught not at Girgaon Chopari, but maybe a little bit further into the sea, where there should be less mercury actually, we saw mercury in them, in those fishes. And now that is because of bioaccumulation. The big fish eat the small. A medium fish eat the small fish, the small fish has already eaten mercury and the mercury stays with the fat of the medium fish then uh, accumulated in the shark and the tuna which big fish like us eat and uh, it accumulates in us. Uh, so we did the various receptor selections. Okay, so now comes to what uh, uh, is the, uh, the sort of last word I, I think I, I need to end. Uh, uh, antibiotics. Big problem, AMR. At least today I read, uh, today or yesterday, I read about one new antibiotic that is 
that will actually that that is probably the uh, first antibiotic to be made uh, in 25 years or so. And this is the first one uh, which the it is not a derivative of the other antibiotics. It uh, it actually does something with the RNA RNA. Don't ask me why. Those are hardcore biology. I, I read that scan through that paper. But it, what it does is that it does uh, bacteria produce antimicrobial resistance by typically methylation of the anti, uh, uh, antibiotics that that are given to it. And that uh, this one cannot be methylated. This particular antibiotic cannot be methylated at all. So the bacteria cannot produce AMR through that route. They either have to use the efflux pump route or some other route anyway. Uh, so th that way this is one of the first uh, new antibiotics which are coming into the market, which might come into the market. Uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, antibiotics all over the place, particularly in water, very much so in water, in food. Uh, how do we detect? We can take the thing to a L, uh, GC, uh, LCMS with and the XYZ detectors and spend 4,000 bucks and do, or we take our, our thingy, put this uh, 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 beta-lactamase on the surface, have the antibiotic go there, uh, and it, it will, uh, because the, the septadesime will bind to the beta-lactamase, you can, you can detect that change happening on the surface, the standard receptor. So here what I am doing is, uh, oh not that, my students have done it, okay. Uh, we are using the enzyme as a sort of receptor. And once it reacts with the receptor, it produces the hydro hydrolysis, which changes the pH, which changes the polyaniline optical properties. So here it actually, all the reaction happens right there on the surface within a few nanometers of the surface, which changes the uh, uh, polyaniline properties, which we can pick up. So we can go down to one nanograms per mil, which is not such a low number, and it is very, very selective to septadism. Uh, we detected uh, that in milk, spiked. Uh, in regular milk, in packaged milk, ultra high pasteurized milk, in cow milk, buffalo milk, all sorts of things. Uh, and if we spiked a little bit in chicken, we can detect it in chicken. Remember, what is the one of the last generation antibiotics, cholestine, was being used for increasing the body weight of chicken. So now it is banned, but uh, still I don't know how much it is being used, really. Uh, so that is not the only antibiotic, there are many others. We can have different types of phenomena. We have a calorimetric sensing phenomena. Let's not get into that. Uh, we have tested it in various matrices, lake water, urine, tap water, and all of that. But uh, this one is very, uh, this one is quite cool. This is uh, ciprofloxacin uh, in uh, Vashi Creek water. Uh, we could go down and detect 0.1 parts per billion. Uh, and quite reproducibly, very nice calibration uh, curve and all. Uh, all these are used based on the antibody to the antibiotic. Now we have a problem. The companies have stopped making the antibodies to the antibiotic. And the later generation of antibiotics, no one can produce an antibody to it at all. Because the antibiotics are meant to kill those bacteria. So the bacteria get, they get, get killed before they can make a antibody to that antibiotic. So, now I have to look for aptamers and things like that, We're trying to detect this. So as I said, we detect uh, ciprofloxacin. We have done all sorts of interference studies. Uh, but what we found was that cipro and enro, they, but they actually stick to this antibody, both of them almost equally well. So we can say, okay, this is the total ciprofloxacin, enrofloxacin load 
in the water or in the sample that we are seeing. Uh, as you see, I mean, all of these are different uh, amounts of Cipro and Enro in the sample, uh, and all of them showed <coughs> almost the same outcomes. I did it in the device and all. So just, uh, I mean, this was all optical fibers. We'll just go a little bit into the paper-based systems, electrical, uh, electrical impedance spectroscopy, or other electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, if you want to call it. <laughs> Started off with myocardial uh, cardiac biomarkers. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Mm, uh, there is a, um, a marker which, I mean, which is very important, and somehow it is very neglected which is called uh, 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 myeloperoxidase. Myeloperoxidase or MPO is a possibly one of the prognostic markers of cardiac or vascular problems uh, in the sense that uh, it uh, a higher level of MPO denotes endothelial instability. I mean, while, while COVID was raging, I, I was trying to tell some of my doctor friends, let's measure MPO from all the patients. Because to me, COVID is a, uh, COVID or the reaction to it has always been endothelial. So if we see endothelial instability, probably it is going to give us a good idea as to what, what is actually happening. And that endothelial instability, mind you, does result in vascular problems, does result in myocarditis, can result in uh, neurological problems and so on. Uh, these, uh, these are very simple sensors. Again, take a piece of paper, take polyaniline aniline and put the paper in it, put um, uh, this uh, and, uh, the oxidizing agent in it and that is it. You have your sensor ready. But only one sensor does not cut it, so we need multiple sensors. Polyaniline, polypyrrole, doped, de-doped, and so on. And as you can see, I mean, these, I mean, these are all the ACM pictures of how the polyaniline, if you see this one, you will, you will get an idea of that, you know, all these little, little bead sort of things, these are all polyaniline which is cut. Functionalize. This is something which Sai had developed long back, right? Polyaniline ka upar, what? Glutaraldehyde, imine bond. Uh, uh, so uh, this is where life takes you. I used to hate chemistry. I mean, I couldn't stand chemistry in my tenth, but uh, tenth board, eleventh board. When I came in, all those chemistry, big jumble, the alphabet soup. Uh, could not stand chemistry. I passed chemistry because my uh, one of my cousin sisters taught me very well. Um, First journal paper, analytical chemistry. Okay, so <laughs> that is what is called, you know, man proposes, God disposes, or irony of fate, whatever we call it. Uh, very simple measurement system. Make the polyaniline coated paper literally painted two electrodes on it. Silver paint, two lines on it. We are just playing around could actually detect with it myoglobin and uh, myeloperoxidase. Slightly higher concentration, yes. But if you can take a piece of paper and dump it in a solution and dump some uh, oxidizing agent in it and take it out and paint two silver silver paint lines and make it into a sensor, there is nothing, at least in the, uh, your, uh, in the college uh, the labs, it will be very useful if not for the, for the doctors. But if you can make this more reproducibly and have a machine to print very ni nice lines with very nice little gap, then obviously this will become a real sensor. Uh, we detected this in water, we detected it in this in human serum. So now, the <laughs> these days, whomever you ask, what are you doing? I am doing data analytics, isn't it true? Okay, people have given up everything for data analytics, okay. You ask them to take a course on biology or biotechnology, physics, ha, karega, 
but let me take the elective in data analytics. Uh, data analytics is good, it is good, it is. But one first year student once taught me, he, he, this first year student came and told me, he had taken electrical engineering. And in, in Bombay, electrical engineering is electrical and electronics, basically. I told him, Hare, your rank is very good. You had a something like 55, 60 rank. You are going to, you must be ch uh, wanting, to, uh, why did you take this? You could have taken computer science. He says, no. I said, you made some mistake. He says, no. I said, uh, then, he said, uh, computer science, they'll write code, they'll do all sorts of analysis, analysis. I'm going to control what they analyze. Because his thing was junk in equal to junk out. He wants to control the junk in. Therefore, he wants to do the front processing on which all the analytics can be done at a later point of time using whatever machines people wanted to use, but that, that guy taught me a very smart thing. Now, have you ever seen a doctor just uh, take one measurement and see this is your disease? No, never, right? And they take a whole bunch of things. Are you fat? Are you... Uh, are you sweating too much? Yeah. Is your pulse racing? Is this thing happening? That thing happening? Then, the, so there are a whole bunch of inputs to be taken, right? And a machine typically does not do that. Machine will tell you you put a, put a uh, hook up a guy to a Siemens machine. The Siemens machine will never ask whether this guy is sweating or whether he is uh, this thing. It will do a ECG and on the basis of the ECG it will say, ah, it's a problem, hai or nahi. That's why quite a few of them are wrong. So, what we as humans do is use a variety of sensors to non-specifically get uh, signals from hard to detect analyze. And that is, that is something which is in, uh, interesting. Use the information acquired not as a single point of parameter detection, but understand the whole etiology and the pathology. Data fusion, image fusion, image coding, they, these have become quite in vogue, but the research is still on because you need lots and lots and lots of data and analytics on that data to figure out whether something, some conclusion that is being made is right or wrong. And therein comes, maybe recreate the scenario of older days, study many, many patients with wide variation of parameters and correlate them. Patients might present with a great variety of clinical symptoms, history statement, and uh, th these are typically influenced by the loquacity of the patient. The patient might be, you know, oh, some patient will come and tell you, was suba, morning 6 o'clock, person got up to evening 8 o'clock, every minute that person will describe, and uh, another patient, you ask, uh, how, uh, how were you today? Thick Okay. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and, the, and uh, this other guy will describe everything. So, what is enough? What is too much? All of these decisions have to be made at some point of time. What is the amount of data that needs to be collected? Rather, let me put it this way. What is the minimum set of data that needs to be collected to make an informed and proper decision? So, what was ANN of yesteryears is now AI, ML, and so on and so forth. I used to call it artificial neural network, and now they call it machine learning. Uh, <laughs> I'm not uh, uh, talking too much about that. And as I said, uh, all of these, the sensors that I talked about, whether it is a paper sensor, whether it's an optical fiber sensor, maybe a sensor bank needs to be established to get different signals in and make sense of a comp of the complex environment that is not only the environment that we live in but our body for that matter i mean some data that i did not show you we could using a bunch of sensors and using some data and uh, doing some teaching machine learning of it could detect between sweet taste salt taste uh, bitter taste and uh, what was that umami no umami was not done Sweet, salt, bitter, and uh, what is sour? Sour. Uh, we could detect between, uh, differentiate between uh, methanol, ethanol, acetone uh, in very small quantities. 
a very small vapor pressures. Acetone obviously we are interested in because diabetic uh, uh, ketone breath. Uh, so, uh, but then again, I mean, there is a lot of work to be done in that. I mean, if you, I mean, uh, uh, do you, does anyone have the time that the Ayurvedas spend with a patient? Ayurveda is you spend day, Ayurveda, you go to an old time Ayurveda person, he will sit with you for two hours at least, asking you uh, more or less history from, uh, from third generation at least. And the tilt, uh, with a very detailed, detailed, detailed question, and finally he'll come to some conclusion. Uh, if it's a good Ayurveda, uh, to us it might seem irrelevant, but I, I don't know really. Frankly, I don't know. I mean, there, uh, whether that is irrelevant or that has a some level of correlation in a good Ayurveda's brain. Uh, so, at the end of it, through all of this. As an engineer, roaming in the domain of physiology, biology, medicine and dabbling in all sorts of scientific and unscientific arts, <laughs> um, one, one conclusion is there that what we cannot measure, we cannot control. And for measurement of anything biological, anything physiological, you will need the engineers. So, for all the biologists over here, make friends with engineers, keep them in hand. <laughs> and with that, thank you very much for a patient listening. Of course, I should have, uh, I should have acknowledged all the uh, money that I got from various agencies and my colleagues and uh, uh, students, I mean, there are many, many other students, but I did not really, uh, I don't have space on a page to put, and, but uh, uh, primarily th those works which I used here, uh, and that is the, that is the, those are the names that are put up. Trying to trying to get it out uh, right now. Uh, two companies are showing interest. The company which is showing more interest and seems to have a better promise is a company from US. The local company sh has a lot of interest, but they don't want to pay a paisa. Uh, so that is a problem. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> whereas the company in US, they will test it and. Uh, I mean, they, they wanted to buy some of the, some of the instruments right now. I said, I cannot really sell them the instruments. I can give it to them for testing. So I gave them some instruments for testing. And if it works out, then yes. Uh, but locally, yes, it will happen. But it is not happening at the speed at which I, I would have liked it to happen. Uh, the, all these, most of these patents are, patents are expired. And as long as someone does not come and try to sell it to me here, I'm okay. Uh, for high prices. I mean, that is why only Indian patents. Okay, let them sell it. I uh, sell it in US. No, I, the point is that that uh, for a for a global patent, uh, it it works out. Bomb. Uh, there there can be ways to protect. Like Coca Cola never patented its sort of uh, idea. If we can hide a few things and. Make that, make that not so easy to copy. Thank you for the very insightful uh, talk, sir. So, a very quick one for the budding industry player in India. So, when we talk about this melting pot of one size, is this uh, essence not to get diluted, to have a hold on the market, the market is growing. On the other end, is the flexibility to navigate. What are your keys to try to balance between these two before you reach excellence? Huh. Extremely good, valid, and uh, no, you don't dilute. You add. Addition does not necessarily mean dilution. 
ok. Uh, what is the uh, is uh, probably the word that I use is one has to be nimble. So, based on the expertise of an area, you have the expertise on that area, you build on that area by picking up other uh, tricks of the trade or another trade and there like that you you know you go you have to have the strength in one area solid. So, but one has to be nimble in today's world one has to be I mean the word that is being used is the nimble education or something. Madam, ischemia can happen anywhere, right? Now, unless some level of infarction sets up, uh, none of these molecules like myoglobin, troponin, CKMB get released. The earliest molecule to release is something called ischemia modified albumin, uh, IMA, and uh, there is one patent on that. Uh, quite a while back the patent by now has I think lost its validity. Uh, it has to do with some cobalt based assay. Now, uh, from the surface of the skin if you want to do a fully electrical uh, sorry uh, electrochemical uh, uh, study then you have to bring the interstitial fluid out. It is quite possible that we are going to have the IMA in that interstitial fluid. But getting that interstitial fluid out in, in a pure form without it affecting the uh, as being affected by sweat and other things which are there might be a little tricky. Uh, so, I mean there bits and pieces of the technology exist, integrating them might be a, a bigger challenge than uh, probably even what I am trying to say. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I don't want to get rid of their jobs. <laughs> or is, is it possible to match their accuracy? Maybe, maybe a hundred years down the road. Uh, no, I, 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 I don't want to match their accuracy. Also, what I'm, what I'm saying is that on a Tropicana orange juice packet. There should be a little tag which says if this tag is green, that means it is 100 percent orange juice. We could detect between freshly squeezed, kept in the fridge, taken out just like Tropicana versus Tropicana is chota chota lika hai uh, made from pulp, 100 percent pulp and water which is okay, which is still good, which is not bad. The pulp has come from Peru or some place, but that is okay. And the one in which or we chota chota me likha hai, that there is 50 percent high fructose corn syrup, okay. <laughs> we could, we could distinguish between them. Can I give you a sense? Can you get the fruit? Or you, you are, you have gone to the market to buy fruits. And you do not want to eat pesticides. Can I give you a sensor where you rub it on the fruit and it tells you whether there is pesticide on the surface or not? That is useful. I, I do not want to take out the job of the super testers and all. They have different, I mean, 100 years down the road. <laughs> Even they cannot match them with LCMS and all that today forget, uh, but this is what I want to so called give, yes we are giving. Yes, 
uh, thought about looking at it, never did. Uh, you see, uh, I have assiduously tried to stay away from um, uh, human uh, tests because of the uh, ethical, bioethical permissions and all sorts of other things that we need. So water is something which no one has any problems with. I mean, everyone has problems with the water, but if I take a mug of water sample from somewhere, no one is going to come and uh, um, uh, catch me for some ethics problems. But that's why all this water, soil and all of this thing. That is, uh, but uh, no, we have done some very limited tests with blood and serum and things like that. After due ethical uh, permissions, which took quite a while. Uh, tear is an interesting fluid. Uh, Google was trying to look at uh, a contact lens sort of thing by which they can detect sugar. Uh, did not pan out beyond a little bit. Uh, by, uh, but I think there is a lot to go in that regard. But it is more important if we can develop a simpler contact lens type of tool to quickly detect Sorgen's disease or something like that which is associated with rheumatoid arthritis and also got, uh, as one of the autoimmune diseases. So quickly detect the extent of spread of the extent of the Sorgen's disease or uh, you know both in the in the mouth drying as well as in the uh, eye, eye drying out. Escape from here, speak my thingy. Otherwise, I'm surely going to forget. Thank you, Professor Mukuchi, for your captivating and uh, insightful lecture on how biosensors and optical fibers are used to solve uh, science or a medical problem. And next, I'd like to call upon Dr. Lokeshwari from Dr. Joseph Thomas Memorial Science Club to uh, present a momentum to our chief guest, Professor Mukuchi. Followed, followed by a word of thanks. Next, I'd like to call upon Dr. Lokeshwari to uh, address the word of thanks. Good evening, one and all. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to propose this word of thanks. Professor Mukherjee, we at the Joseph Thomas Memorial Science Club and IIT Madras are very grateful and thankful to you for readily agreeing to be here to deliver today's need of the hour lecture. I thank the head of the Department of Biotechnology, the director of IITM, faculty of the Department of Biotechnology for their warm and ready involvement in conducting this lecture. But for their timely assistance, coordination by Dr. Kritika, Professor Manoj, Professor Gopal, Professor Anju Chadda, Office of the Biotechnology Department, we could not have succeeded in having this program today. I especially like to thank Kritika Ravi for successfully managing all our suggestions, telecasting, and other arrangements for the last few days for today's program. I sincerely thank the audience, comprising of students and faculty from various uh, local colleges, including Dr. NGR Medical University, uh, IIT itself, uh, many online 
local college members from Srihar, from Sri Balaji Vidyapit Puducherry. Many of them are still online with us, and other online participants for being uh, for listening to this wonderful, uh, insightful lecture. The members of the Dr. J T Memorial Science Club earnestly hope that uh, in these past 16 years, with all the 16 esteemed speakers on this platform, have inspired research as a career option for all of you youngsters. I especially like to thank Mrs. Meena Thomas and her family members, Dr. George Thomas, Dr. Mohan Nair, Dr. Anju Chadda, Dr. Rama, Dr. Parni Appan, Dr. Shivaraman, who is with us today, uh, Dr. Prabhakaran, and Dr. Narayanan, Dr. Nagarajan, many of his former colleagues for their support and for, uh, for these activities and for also being online with us today. I thank the audiovisual team, the Office of the Biotechnology Department, and each one of you who are present here today in person and were online. Thank you very much. I'll invite you for refreshments which is served outside the hall today. Thank you so much.